Alabama beat Georgia 27-24 last night. We were on the field for this one. Instant classic in Atlanta. Uh, top three college football environment that I've been in. Just big game programs going at it, man. I told you there was a feeling in the South, and there always is when these two meet, that it is a national championship game. And by, by that, I mean the winner thinks they're going to go on to win the national title. Both teams feel that way, by the way. Like I can tell you, Georgia left Mercedes-Benz Stadium last night the exact same way that Bama looked at Georgia last year when they didn't get to play them. They are thinking they're going to go win the title because we didn't stop them. Like we didn't get in the way and do something about it. They're going to go win a title. Uh, whether that happens remains to be seen. Unbelievable atmosphere. I think I met like half of our audience last night in Atlanta. So um, I got to tell you something. I would love to take credit. And yes, I did pick Bama to win the game. But uh, I, I said something really dumb, really stupid. So earlier this year, I didn't have producer Jesse pull the video because this is already bad enough. Uh, earlier this year, around week three, I came on the air and I said, I'm not backing off my championship prediction. I'm still picking Bama to win the SEC this year, but I'm telling you their coaching staff's not good enough. Like their coaching staff is so down and I so wrong. It's just, I said, it was so stupid to say, because this is one of the best coaching jobs, not only Saban's done, but his staff has worked their tail off. Like Eric Wolford, that offensive line, what they've been now versus what they were. Uh, look at T-Rob's secondary. You got Kool-Aid goes down in an SEC championship game last night. They got Trey Amos, ULL transfer, just ready to come in. They throw right at him with Bowers, pass breakup, had another big pass breakup on the sideline. Think about how the hiring of Tommy Reese as OC and Kevin Steele as DC were received. And then look at those two units right now and look at how much they've improved. Kevin Steele has got Alabama's defense with some of the same players who underwhelmed last year playing outside their minds. They allowed 78 rushing yards to Georgia yesterday with a banged up defensive front, if they're being honest. Uh, Freddie Roach, that defensive line, like those guys have coached their tails off. And you had someone like me dumb enough to say at the beginning of the year, I just don't know if the quality of the coaching staff is there. Well, I was wrong, dead wrong, uh, because it is there. And Nick Saban's getting a lot of credit, and he should get a lot of credit. But man, if you've listened to Saban talk, and he did it again last night, he's deflected a lot of that, and he's made special sure to dole out praise publicly to his staff because he knows they had to course correct on the fly. Like, they had to course correct midseason this year. Last night, I think the most glaring thing to me was Georgia could not run the ball on Alabama because Georgia was the second most physical team on the field. I think a lot of you hear that and you say, oh, that's pretty impressive to do that. No, it's out of this world. To be able to take a Kirby Smart team and to be able to make them the second most physical team on the field is one of the hardest things to do in college football. Nobody does it. You may mess around, and you could upset Georgia by having them be minus three turnovers, or you go 14 score on special teams, or you smoke and mirror your way to a victory, but you're not going to out-physical them. And I'm not telling you it was done in a landslide last night, because that's impossible. Uh, Bama was the more physical team, and that surprised me. It really surprised me, and it is yet another testament to that coaching staff that Georgia hangs 78 rushing yards. And listen, Georgia did a great job. I fought against Alabama running the ball. I mean, Bama had under three yards per carry. Bama was three of 13 on third downs. Those stat categories uh, don't light the world on fire. In fact, if I tell you that Friday, you may think those are padlock stats that indicate a Georgia victory is coming. And then if I tell you Jalen Milrow is going to be held without a pass of more than 30 yards in a game for the first time this year, then you really think Georgia's got this thing, unless catastrophe strikes. And uh, Bama still found a way to win. And they found a way to win because they shut down the ground game, and Georgia doesn't have difference makers at receiver. And if they did, it would be Ladd McConkie and Brock Bowers, both of whom played at less than 100% last night. In fact, I would argue far less than 100%. In the case of McConkie, uh, Warriors effort for either of those guys to be on the field last night, by the way, like Kirby was dead serious with you last week when he talked about the health status of those guys. But uh, the first thing that I, I wanted to go back to there is uh, Jalen Milrow is just an incredible story, man. Jalen Milrow 
comes into this season, has a really nightmarish game against Texas. We were there when that game happened in week two. Week three, he's benched. I told you at the time that I thought there were portions of Alabama's team that gave far less than 100% effort that afternoon, largely in protest of him being benched. And I think I'm right about that. And if you go back and you look at the effort that those guys gave against USF, and then you fast forward to now, those look like total different human beings. And they're not. They're the same humans. But it is a different team. When they say that about Bama, now they're right. It is a different team. Players will tell you who the starting quarterback is, and they were telling you, even after that Texas game, he's the guy who gives us the best chance to win. Locker room largely knows which guy gives them the best chance to win. You can play favorites in spring. You can have your boy that you like to hang out with more in summer. But come fall camp, and especially come the season, your friend at quarterback is the one that gives you the best chance to be a winner because no one wants their buddy leading them to a 6-6 six and six season. And Jalen Milrow has been the guy, and those players knew it, that was going to give Alabama the best chance to win. And they laid, some of them laid down against USF. And then they got him back, and they've surged largely ever since. They have surged, and now it's a totally different looking team. Milrow was the most important player in this game last night, I think. And he didn't light the world on fire. He didn't have a single pass more than 30 yards, first time all year. But, you know, things like that shovel pass on third down to, I think, Isaiah Bond that kept that drive alive, just, it, it is, it's unquantifiable how much value there was on that play. Just like on the last drive, when they need to melt clock and he rips off 40, 50 yard run and falls down inbounds, you can't know. I just know that it was one of the deciding moments in the game. He got sacked, what was it, Jesse? Four times, I think, last night. Didn't give the ball away. Uh, threw a couple that could have been picked, but they weren't. And that's another one of the hidden, unquantifiable moments, several moments from these games. Beck threw two or three balls that should have been picked. Milrow threw a couple of balls that shouldn't have been picked. If either team has DBs with good hands last night, either one of them could have won double-digit victories. Either one of them could have, because that's how small the margins are when teams like this play or like these play. Uh, speaking of the secondary, and, and speaking to T-Rob, who's the DB coach there and is doing an incredible job this year, by the way, like the single most noticeable facet of Alabama's defense that's just on a different level this year is their secondary contests everything. You make complete passes on them, but there, there are very rarely guys running wide open. They play as physical as I've seen an Alabama secondary play in a while, and they got quality depth. And you saw a future first-round draft pick at corner go down last night. Kool-Aid goes down, concussed, and Trey Amos comes in off the bench. And I know he's a guy they consider to be a starter, but he is not a guy at all who's been thrust into that kind of position. And Mike Bobo and that Georgia offensive staff, they're down in the red zone. They go right at him first play, and he breaks up a pass to Bowers and played phenomenally you otherwise never would have even known he was in the game, which is one of the biggest compliments that you can give to a defensive back. But I was just selfishly, you know, I'm looking at him. I'm kind of happy for him because I remember when we were talking about transfer portal last year and, you know, we're doing our rankings and we're talking about Travis Hunter goes here. We're talking about Fentrell Cypress. Those were some of the top rated corners, good players. We didn't talk about Trey Amos a whole lot. He was a kid from the, from the Sun Belt and he comes up to Alabama and Look, they thought he was going to be a good depth provider, was about the extent of the coverage you got on him. And there you are, SEC championship game. And he's thrust into action and is one of the players of the game. It was, a, it was an incredible night for Alabama. Uh, for that program, I know it's validation. Um, I'm, I'm down there a few weeks ago. I go work out in their weight room, and David Ballou's in there. He's a strength and conditioning coach. And I talked to him probably for an hour uh, just about philosophy, how you constantly have to be on the cutting edge, how you tweak this and you tweak that. And he was just candid about some things he felt like they had fallen short in years past, and here's what we do to address it. Imagine being him, standing on that field and watching your team physically lean forward on Georgia. No one else does that. And so it's just folks are always working. Georgia's a monster. Like, Georgia's an incredible program. To me, I'll shift gears here for a second. I'll talk about Kirby. I got a ton of time to talk about Kirby. Georgia's a monster. They're not going anywhere. I mean, they'll be here a decade from now in all likelihood. To me, the most impressive part of this was, yeah, Georgia ended up coming up short in the SEC championship game, but they were there undefeated again with a massive target on their back. 
you got two straight years of winning titles, and you have consequences of success that people don't think exist. A casual would tell you the more you win, the easier it gets. In reality, it's the total opposite. And one of the biggest things you fight is complacency most of the time. The most impressive part of this year for Georgia is I didn't, I didn't sense a whiff of that. Now, you're not guaranteed. It's not your birthright to win just because you prepare. And <clears throat> sorry about that. You got talented players. But uh, that's not the reason they lost. And so like, I, I think Kirby and Georgia deserve a ton of credit for that. I'm going to take a sip right quick, Colin. And the eyes got watery, too. That, ugh. Emergency Mio. And we got coffee just in case. So an incredible SEC championship game. Blessed to have been there. Um, I, I don't really want to do the coaching comparison thing. Like, Kirby's one of the best in the game. Saban's the best that I've ever seen do it. Saban's the best that anyone's ever seen do it. But a lot of you doubted that the guy at Alabama still has his fastball. I don't think that fell on deaf ears in that organization this last week. I'm just going to leave it at that.